everybody. Welcome to the first of several digital fabrication video tutorials. Um, this is uh, going to be the first one. It's on sort of surface alteration and creating something easily producible on the CNC. Um, so bear with me. I'm actually using a Mac because our school computers don't have any of the screen capturing software on it. So um, I'm going to be using, I have a software called Parallels and that allows me to emulate a Windows desktop sort of as a program on my Mac. And then within the Mac, we're going to run um, Grasshopper and Rhino. So uh, I'll jump into that in a second, but I just wanted to show um, what we're going to be doing today really fast. So this is a sort of several different versions. I'm going to go into this pers pers perspective view. Um, several different versions of altering a surface using multiple points and then sort of radially um, having a, a wave pattern come out from it and then causing some sort of constructive or destructive interference. Um, so this is what we're going to make and uh, it's you know easy to be done on the CNC and um, by the end of this tutorial I'll walk through the entire sort of script and uh, how to go through and produce it on your own. Um, so if we're going to start at the very, very beginning, uh, we'll get into this script a little bit later, but a brief summary. It creates a grid across a surface. You have several points that you register early in the script. Uh, if you haven't ever seen any of this, don't be worried, but um, basically what's going to happen is you create a graph and it moves those points up or down in order to create your wave. Okay, so you have a grid and then slowly but surely you get um, different sort of forms if you adjust the different parameters here. Okay, so I'm going to start at the very beginning um, and we'll be able to go through this. The script itself isn't that complicated, um, but if you've never done this before, I can understand how you're feeling because I only started learning last this, this last month or like six months ago. Um, so uh, we're going to start at the, at the very beginning, okay? Are you ready? So I'm going to close this, and I'm going to close this, and we're going to open a new uh, instance of Rhino and Grasshopper. Okay, so to open Rhino, it's pretty straightforward. You click on the icon, it'll open up a window. You can see some of your early projects that you worked on previously. Um, I started following some YouTube tutorials on Lunchbox, which is a plugin for Grasshopper, to create sort of structure on any sort of surface you can plug in. Um, so now we have Rhino. Now if you've never used Rhino, uh, it's, it's a really, really nice piece of software for simple modeling, but also I like to use it to create architectural diagrams. Um, so if you want to create a box, you can enter it coordinates. There's a command line up here, you can click on box. I'll go through this sort of in class and there are much better tools than um, what I'm going to show you today in order to get into it. But you can type 000, which is the origin, and it sort of moves the first point of your box to the origin. And then I have it set up for feet and inches. Um, so I have my grid down here, and I can go 12, 12, 0, which is my x coordinate, my y coordinate, and my z, which is the height in this instance. So I'll hit enter. Okay. And that puts it at 12 feet by 12 feet. And then I can hit another 12, and I have a box. Okay. So. Um, Pretty, pretty straightforward modeling. Left click allows you to drag and rotate around an object. Um, scrolling is, you know, zoom. That's pretty typical. And then uh, your right or your um, left click is your select. Maybe I said left click before. Anyways, so left click select. Right click is orbit, or I think that's that's the SketchUp equivalent. Um, and then you can come up here into your different types of views. Uh, so I like personally the ghosted view the most. It allows me to see all of the different edges of the shape that I'm making and uh, breaks down sort of the form a lot better than something like this, uh, the shaded view, um, which is nice if you're just sort of trying to create diagrams or something. You can zoom way out. Uh, there's this nice command that you guys can learn about later, but if you type in make 2D, it'll pull up this, just hit OK. And uh, it'll give you the edges broken down from your perspective view uh, so you can create diagrams in Illustrator rather quickly. So anyways, that's not why we're here, but um, I just felt it was important to sort of break down 
you know, a few of the barriers around Rhino. You don't need to know any Rhino in order to do any of the stuff we're going to do today. It's all, it's all in Grasshopper. Um, you do just need to know how to make a couple of points, and you can just type point into this command bar up here. Okay, so I'll go through it. Um, so I, when I start this up, I put the uh, Rhino window on the right-hand side. You know, you can put it wherever. Um, but in order to start Grasshopper, all you do is you type Grasshopper into this command bar up here. You press it, it's going to load up this sort of Grasshopper. Now, a brief sort of history on Grasshopper. Grasshopper is a computational design tool that a lot of architects use. Um, it's a plugin for Rhino that comes natively installed, but Grasshopper itself almost acts, in a, in a lot of ways, it acts almost as a standalone program, and it has its own plugins and libraries that people have built to support it because it's such a powerful tool. Um, it is a, and, and let's not kid ourselves here, it is a visual.net programming language. So it's a way to visually program for people that don't have sort of a background with uh, working in a terminal or a command prompt instance in, in Windows or a PowerShell and um, creates really strong uh, parametric or um, computational design. So um, if you want a history of that, you know, you can, you can Google it. Uh, I'll go over it in class, or I'll, I'll have gone over it in class, and there will be a PowerPoint on the server. Um, so uh, it'll, it'll be more straightforward later, but I'm just going to get into this now. Um, so this launches. I have all these sort of plugins, and for some reason they're not working. So I'm just going to hit close. If there are any other me error messages that pop up, just sort of hit close, and it'll work on its own. Um, so this is Rhino and Grasshopper. Um, these are the, the two windows side by side. So you can create sort of your, your workflow here. And then over in Rhino, you're going to be able to see it as long as you're in this perspective view. OK, so I'll, uh, I'll set things up and, and be ready to go here. Um, so anyways, just a brief you know, intro to, to my setup. Uh, Grasshopper and Rhino are on all of the computers in, in the Bridge Lab in Marvin Hall but also in Chalmers and uh, in the bottom of snow. I you know, personally like to run it on my own computer, so I have my own Windows instance running inside of Parallels, again, like I said. Um, and then uh, I bought Rhino. Rhino is $199 for students. Grasshopper comes free with it. So it's, uh, it's a pretty nice setup because I can work in, in, in between all of the different um, software tools I have, like uh, all of my Adobe Suite on my Mac, which I prefer, and um, in Windows. So getting through all of that, I know I've been talking for about eight minutes at this point, but um, the, uh, let's, let's get started on our, our definition. Okay, so the first thing um, that I like to know about Grasshopper or Rhino is that um, Rhino works best as, as your modeling tool, and Grasshopper works best when you register things or, or coordinate with things inside of this rhinoceros window, okay? So um, the way we start this script in particular and the way uh, you'll start a lot of other things just in general is if I create sort of a, a line, and I'll start it at 0, 0, 0. That's the origin. That's where I like to start sort of all things. Um, and right now I have orthographic mode on, I'm going to turn that off, and I'm just going to draw a line to whatever point. And it defaults to sort of being on this grid. Okay, so I'm going to click here, hit the space bar to finish drawing a line. Okay, now I have a line. I also have gumball on, which allows me to sort of move this in any direction. I can rotate it on an axis, which I really, it's, it's my favorite part about this software. Um, so anyways, I have this line. Okay, now uh, working between the two softwares for a lot of people becomes pretty tricky. Um, but here's the, the most simple way to think about it is if you have a line in Rhino, you also have it in Grasshopper. But it doesn't know it's there unless you register it. So I'm going to type in curve. Okay, now uh, maybe I just glossed over that. But notice how I did this. So there are these tabs up on the top side that allow you to jump through different types of geometry or different types of conditions. We'll get into those later. Um, but there's a geometry referencing set of, of these blocks, okay? So 
um, you can drag curve down into your main display here, okay? And then you have sort of this block. It represents, you know, you got to, you, you have this curve um, block, but it doesn't sort of have anything attached to it. So it's, it's showing up orange. Uh, the other way you can do that is if you double click in this, this field here, uh, just click twice with your left click button and type curve. You have access to everything up here in this tray, but you know if you know what it is, you don't have to go searching around for it. Okay, so either way works, um, but in the end you have the same result. Okay, so I'm just going to hit delete and get rid of one of those. Um, so this curve doesn't mean anything right now. You have to go through and you have to register it, or you have to set one curve. That means you're coordinating what Grasshopper knows and what Rhino knows at the same time. Okay. So I'm going to hit register, one curve. I already had this selected, so um, I'm going to sort of delete that and do it again just to make it a little clearer. So I'll type curve. I'll hit set one curve, and then it's going to ask me over here to select a curve or an edge to reference. Okay, and then I'm going to click on that one. So now I have this curve means this line in Rhino. Okay, line, curve, they're the same same thing. Um, so the, the language is a little bit different than what we're used to using, but uh, it, it becomes important a little further down the road. So we, we register curves and we register lines together in order to get a better sense of uh, how to control geometry in Rhino. So let me, um, let me give an example. So if I have a curve and I want to divide this curve, okay, well, it, it'll, uh, and I'm going to turn on full names here. It makes it a little easier for you to uh, learn it in, in the process. So I have this, this tool here. Okay, so this gets into um, sort of this programming base understanding that, that Grasshopper does. It's, it is a programming language, and this is sort of a, a, this is a note. So it's a collection of different um, pieces of code that that do something for you. So just seeing it as blocks and seeing what you need to plug into it in order to get the different outputs makes it a lot easier for someone who doesn't know how to code to learn from the very start. So it's it's a nice way to get an understanding of computer language or um, computer thought and uh, start from a relatively you know basic understanding of lines and geometry and work your way up to something a little more complex. So in order to make this work we're gonna connect the curve to the the curve. All right, so now it's it's dividing this curve a. I, I think the default's probably ten times, um, and you can change that. So the count is set as an integer to ten. Okay, but if you set it to about five, right, it'll uh, it'll do less. And um, let's let's briefly just run over something real fast, uh, and I can get into this in class too. The um, when a computer counts, it starts at zero. Okay, so if you're going to count on your fingers, your first finger would be one, right? But if a computer was going to count on your fingers, that first finger is zero. So you go from zero to nine, and you have ten values. Does that make sense? Uh, and I know you can't answer that question, but anyways, um, we're going to get into uh, we'll, we'll get into that a little more in detail later. But it, it means a significant amount when we're talking about how long lists become, or how many sets of coordinates you have. Uh, computer counting and your normal type of counting that you've learned all your life is just a little bit different. Uh, instead of starting at one, um, you should now just start thinking like you start at zero. And uh, that'll become more evident later. So this is the zeroth point. This is the first point, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth. You get it. Um, so. Let's uh, let's talk about making this a little more parametric. So we have this side, uh, or this line with divisions in it, and we're going to turn and we're going to make it into a line with um, a set of divisions that you can control. So there are these things in Grasshopper called sliders, okay, number sliders. Now, as default, they come in as a sort of spectrum between zero and one, and you have three digits. But if you double click on it. You can change the value, or if you right-click on it, you can edit it. Okay. Now, editing is uh, the the best way to get what you want out of each block, but um, I understand that most people don't want to do that. So, 
we can't divide a curve by a partial number. We need integers. So we're going to click on integer numbers. Um, <clears throat> and we can go, it's going to start at zero, um, but that, that value won't really make any sense. You can't divide something zero times. Um, you can divide it once though, and uh, if, if you're thinking about it the right way now, that, that'll mean one division in the middle. Um, so I'm going to set the max to 10. Okay, and now we have a, a slider that goes from 0 all the way up to 10. All right, everybody should try controlling that. And now you're going to plug that into the count. Okay, so if you're dividing it twice, right, one, one times total, you have one segment. That means you have two points and one line in between it. If you're only having one, that means you're not going to get any points. Um, that's a little complicated, but anyways, you just move this slider and uh, the number of points on the line can, can change and go up. Now, this is important because if the points, right, because we have coordinates now for each one of these points coming out of this box, um, if you want another set of lines, right, so I'm going to use this box. It's called Line, Start, Direction, and Length. Um, you can set up these points to be the reference start point for any other sort of command. So now you have a line at each one of those points and the direction is straight up. Okay, so you can change that. Um, I'm going to use an X vector. So plug that into direction. It doesn't have to have a measurement. Right? And now all of these things are going to the side. So I hope that that's clear for everybody. And then you can also sort of, you can change the length too. I'm just going to plug it into the same slider. And uh, now we have this set of lines that changes length based on the overall number. I don't know why you'd ever want that, but it's a great way to sort of get an idea of how you register geometry, you plug it into some sort of command, you can have a slider that alters that set of commands and then your output is something that depends on on the values that came from your first command okay so this is a very very simple definition um, we're going to build on this uh, directly in our next uh, set so why don't we jump into the assignment right now um, I'm going to start from the beginning again not assuming that you've watched some of this but um, I'm not going to explain everything in as much detail. Um, you're welcome. So uh, why don't we just delete everything we have? So I'm going to select everything. You can drag up from the bottom, same as in like AutoCAD or Rhino or Illustrator or something like that. And it's going to just select everything it touches. And then I'm going to delete that. Okay, and I'm also going to delete this line. Cool. So now we're back to square one. I'm sorry. Um, for our first assignment, which is going to be this set of surface alterations, uh, we're going to start by creating the surface that we want to alter, like a flat surface. You don't have to, but it's, it's a lot more straightforward if you do it that way. So I'm going to create a rectangle. I'm going to start it at my origin, and then I'm going to move it out the way. Um, I don't like picking arbitrary numbers, but you can literally just click anywhere. Uh, one of the challenges with digital fabrication is making sure that your digital geometry and your physical geometry, the, the stock that you're cutting, match up. So I'm going to pick 18 by 18, and I'm not going to give it any height. And that's going to be 18, 18, 0. I guess this is in feet, so um, I'm actually going to do 1.5, comma, 1.5, comma, 0. Um, and that's going to be my... Uh, my next corner and that's going to create a surface okay so now I have a, a surface and it's a foot and a half by foot and a half um, but it doesn't really do or mean anything until we register it in Grasshopper so I'm going to double click in this canvas here and I'm going to type surface okay and and this is a primitive um, block it means that it registers to basic geometry in Rhino I'm going to type surface I'm going to click on it I'm going to right click on it I'm going to hit set one surface, and then I'm going to click on this. Okay, so now we have this this surface registered in Rhino. 
okay? It exists. And it exists in, in our uh, plugin software too, okay? Um, now the next thing I'm going to do, and this will be more uh, understandable later, is I'm going to put down a point. So I'm going to, actually this time I'm going to type point in Grasshopper first, and then I'm going to go over here and I'm going to type point in Rhino, and then it's going to ask me, hey, where do you want to put this point? Um, I know that this is a foot and a half by a foot and a half, so I'm going to put it at 0 0.75, comma, 0 0.75, comma, zero. And that's going to be the center of this surface. So now I'm going to go back over to the point over here. I'm going to hit set one point, and I'm going to click on the one that we just put down. Okay? So now we have our two things in, in Rhino and in Grasshopper, which is a great starting point. Okay, so now we're going to get into this assignment in general. Um, and maybe just a quick grasshopper thing. I always like to have my register geometry as far over to the left as possible. You can put things on and off this canvas. It's just here as a nice way of, of referencing where you are in, in this grasshopper world. It, you know, is a really big um, endless grid that you can use. But um, I always like to have any sort of sliders or any things that I'm registering over here along this side so that I can see if they're not working or what the values are right when I start opening the script, okay? Um, so from there, I'm going to, uh, I'm actually gonna put this down here because I know where this is going. Um, I'm gonna type another command, okay? Now you can use your tabs up here to find any sort of command you want. Um, intersect, surface commands, uh, and this is a divide surface, but I'm actually just gonna type it down here, divide, surface okay and once I've had it or once I once I see it in my list I'm gonna double click on it okay so divide surface is a pretty straightforward command you you plug in a surface and then it creates a set of points on that surface given a u or a v in in our case you can just think of that as an x and a y value but u and v really references the x and y of the surface itself so um, it's not related to the grid, it's, it's related to the surface you created. Um, I want, and for this assignment it's best to use a square grid, but you don't have to. So I'm going to create a number slider. Um, you can do this a number of ways. I always double click on the canvas, that's my native way of doing it. Um, but uh, you can create a slider very simply by typing 1 is less than whatever value you want, you want it to start at, and then 30. So you have the lowest value, the value that the slider is going to be on by default, and then you're going to have the maximum value of your slider. I'm going to type that. So now we have a number slider, and it's, it works from your numbers 1 to 30. Sorry if I'm you know, making this very simple, but um, I think it helps for some people if they have a language difficulty, or um, just from the very start taking time to go over each thing. I know I hate piecing together things when people don't explain, it, explain them properly, okay? So now we have the surface. It's divided by a number of points. As long as we're clicking on this, we're previewing it. Um, you can alter that. I, it, the selected command pops up green in your, in your Rhino window. You can change that. I'm not going to get into that now. Um, so if we alter the number of, of points, right, it's dividing this surface more and more and more, okay? so. Uh, I like having about probably 15 is a really nice number for us to start at. Um, and that's going to uh, end up being basically a, a level of resolution we have in this surface that we've created. Okay? So um, this is pretty straightforward uh, so far. Um, it's going to get a little more complicated right now. Um, so now we're going to use a command called pull point. Okay, pull point, um, well, I guess there, it explains it, but um, it generates a set of distances from one point to the rest of, you know, something else that's registered. So in this case, we're going to use these points, okay, and we're going to plug this in as our, as our set of points in, in, the, in what we're trying to figure out. Um, and then we're going to register our, our point that's sort of in the center of the surface as our geometry that we want it to sort of generate um, our distances, okay? So um, to reiterate, 
all this is doing is it's taking each one of these points and it's figuring out the distance from say this point to this point or from this point to this point and it's all going to be different and it's going to generate in a list okay so we have our list of points okay so then we're going to take that and we're going to plug it in as a set of boundaries or bounds okay um, this is creating a domain so we're going to plug in the distances and basically all all these are doing is it's um, setting this up so that when we plug in any sort of graph later um, the same graph is sort of uh, it, it's it's mirrored all the way around this radially um, so anyways these these distances you have you know like obviously a really small one closest to this point and you have a really large one you know far away from this point so what it's doing is it's taking the smallest point and the largest point and it's creating a domain so you have this this domain of numbers that exists in between each one of those um, and from there we're going to actually remap the distances that each one of these has to this this new domain so say you had a, a scale from one to ten or in, in mathematical terms we're talking about domains and, and ranges um, maybe you learned about that uh, a long time ago just to clarify a, a domain or a range is just um, a set of numbers contained within a, a spectrum um, there's differences in between each but we can get into that later so if you have a, a scale of numbers 1 to 5 and you have a scale of numbers 1 to 10 and you want to remap those it's going to take the highest value in your scale of 1 to 5 which would be 5 and it's going to skew it's going to like multiply your scale each number in your scale by the value that it would need by the proportion that it would need in order to be worth 10 so in this case it would be 2 um, but that's a really simplified way of thinking about it uh, we can talk about that later or if you get into more advanced stuff in Grasshopper just know that we're taking all of the distances here and we're going to remap them to the domain that we just created okay so these are our values here. and then these are going to be our sources now there's one thing I forgot to mention um, so you see how there's this structure that comes in you have 0 0 0 has 16 um, values in it this is a um, this is a list structure so these points come out of here these, these distances from the one point to the many points comes out in a set of, of uh, it's, it's called a tree and this tree has a specific data structure there are different things you can do to it um, in this case we're just gonna hit flatten and basically what that does is it collapses this tree down into a set of its just most basic values so instead of having 256 values split up in 15 15 here let me actually you can plug in a panel and the panel will show you exactly what you're looking at um, instead of having 15 trees with 16 values each it's just gonna have one tree with all 256 values I hope that makes more sense sorry if that's confusing we can talk about that later okay so um, now we're gonna go and we're going to uh, plug in this thing called a graph mapper okay and this is the part that I think is gonna get a little little more basic I hope you weren't overwhelmed previously we type in graph mapper okay this this sort of blank square pops up and if you right click on it you can go down to graph types and I click sine graph okay sine graph creates a sinusoidal wave you can move this point up here and change the period amplitude and frequency of of your graph so we're gonna take and we're gonna plug in our mapped numbers to this graph okay now it doesn't look like it's doing doing anything right now but it'll it'll make a little more sense here in a minute um, 
So uh, I'm going to actually skip a little further to the end so that we can think about how this is going to work. Um, I'm going to type in a move command. Sorry if all of that was a little confusing. The move command allows you to register any geometry and move it in any way. So right now we're going to move these points, which is our geometry, okay? And then we have to figure out how we want to move them. All right, so we've created this domain and range and remapped the distances so that um, whatever this wave does is, uh, is, is um, mirrored radially around the outside of this point. So all of these are going to move in the same way sort of along a section, okay? So if you look at this in section, this is what it's going to produce, or I guess one half of it is going to produce this wave because this is going to be your, your center point, okay? So um, we're going to take and we're going to multiply. Actually, we don't have to do that yet. We're going to use this and we're going to type in amplitude. Okay, now amplitude is a way of thinking about, um, we have this sort of wave that we want to create. And obviously this is, the amplitude of a wave itself um, is just sort of the overall height from the top to the bottom. Um, so we're going to take and we're going to plug this into the amplitude. Uh, and then we're going to go and we're going to plug in a Z vector. Okay, so I want to move these points vertically, right? And then uh, Z is our vertical axis, so I'm going to plug in a Z vector. Okay. So now this, this is working. If you don't have you know, everything necessary for it to operate, it's, it's not going to work. So we have a vector. Okay. And now we're going to plug this in to the motion. So to, to get at this before I, I show you what it does, um, you now have a wave form. And it's taken into account all of the distances from the center point to the furthest point, And it's remapped it as sort of a radial grid around the outside of it, or a, a, pol a polar set of coordinates. Um, and now we're multiplying those values using this wave as the amplitude. And then we're going to move them up based on the high points or the low points in this wave. Okay? So I'm going to plug this in. So it doesn't look like it's working, but it is. Okay. So um, that's that's the part of this can, that can get a little bit confusing. Uh, I'm going to take and I'm going to move this down. Okay. And I'm going to turn off everything else. So I'm just going to select the rest of this. I'm going to turn off the preview. I did that by right clicking on it. I'm going to turn this off. Okay, so now I'm going to click back on this geometry and lo and behold we have this sort of set of points, okay, and they're being um, altered in, in section radially around this one point by this graph. So you can turn up the height or you can turn it down um, I'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, but um, all you need to think about right now is uh, how this graph alters these points, right? So if it's just a very gentle um, change in sweep, it, it alters them more dramatically. So if you turn up the settings really far, it, it just sort of becomes nonsense. Uh, I can explain that to anybody in person, but basically it's because since you have this organized grid of points, if the wave happens to be more frequent than your points do, uh, it causes this interference and resonance pattern within your own um, uh, system. So that's not too important, but why don't we make this a little bit easier to look at and also manufacturable with the CNC. And what we're going to do is we're going to um, create a surface from points. This gets the control points from surface. This makes a surface from points. Don't mix those up. So I'm going to click on that. I'm going to plug our geometry, our points in here. 
And then we also need a, uh, a grid count on the surface of it. Okay, so um, I'm going to just set this up. Uh, type addition. Okay, that's going to give you a addition command. You can do multiplication, division, whatever. Um, but I'm going to add one to the overall number. So I'm going to create a slider. I'm going to start with zero, one, ten. I didn't hit enter, sorry. Zero, one, ten. Hit enter. Okay, now I have a number slider. I'm going to plug this into the B. I'm going to plug that into the U. Now I need something for this to actually multiply by. So we're going to go all the way back to the beginning. I'm going to take our original set of points and plug that into our addition. Now, um, this wasn't flattened. You're going you're gonna to need to do that for it to work. But um, basically, uh, to, to jump through that one more time, because I just glossed over it because I really wanted to have this visual so I could explain it. Um, you have this geometry. It's a set of points. And like I said before, if you uh, take and flatten something, instead of having a tree that sort of comes out of the back of this, as 256 points broken down into sort of 15 groups of 16 each. Uh, what I did is I took that and I broke it down into 256 individual values. Okay, um, but that doesn't really help you because you need a and, and you want to create a surface from these points. So you can do that, but in order to create a surface, you need a grid sort of around it, and that that gives you an understanding of the number of divisions that's going to happen. So I took and I added 1 to the original number we had, which was 15, um, because if we just had 15, it wouldn't work. I can explain that some other time. Uh, and I plugged that into our U count. So now when I alter the slider at the beginning and increase the resolution, it's going to create the surface the same way every single time. Okay? Um, and just another thing that you might want to do to this script that makes it just a little bit easier uh, is if you take and you multiply this value here by 2.0 and you can do that on a number slider if you just type 2 um, you don't have to add the greater than or less than every single time and you type multiplication I'm gonna plug the output of this graph and this 2 into each other and then I'm going to take and I'm just going to plug this result down into the amplitude here. So instead of, um, this is going to allow me to vary how much this affects the, the surface of this, this point. So because the value is 2, or you can make it greater, but you can also make it less. You know, you can set it at 0. I'm going to go in and I'm going to edit this. And I'm going to give it an extra um, set of digits. So it doesn't need 3, but 10 and, you know, another significant figure that you can use would, would make things easier. So now I'm going to go in and I'm going to make that, you know, half or 0.5. I'm going to increase this period. So the reason this one, it, it looks so dynamic for me is probably because um, the units that I'm using in Rhino and Grasshopper you know, this thing is only 1.5 unit wide um, and 1.5 unit tall. So the, the deviation in height of 1 is basically half of the, or two-thirds of the surface. Um, so I just plug this in so that uh, I can decrease how much height is coming off of this surface as I create it. And now I can show you a little bit more about what happens if you increase you know, like the, the number of waves coming off of that. Sorry, that, that was weird. Okay, all right. And now, to make things just a little bit simpler, um, I'm going to click on this point again, and it's going to bring up my gumball controls in, um, in Rhino. The reason Grasshopper is probably my favorite tool um, is because now I can move this point, and it's going to alter the surface. And even more than that, I can create another one by type, you know, hitting Command C, 
and then Command V, it's going to put another one right in place. And I can move that over. This point isn't registered in the software, so it's not going to affect anything. Okay? But if I type point again over here and click set one point, and I already had that selected over here, so I can select something else. But, anyways, um, if I select one point and then if I hold shift and drag this point into the geometry, right, that's where the other one's connected. I'm going to turn off the preview. I just selected this, and then on top of it I right-clicked, and I deselect the preview. Okay, so now when I click on something else, or if I turn this off, you're not going to see what's selected. So I'm going to turn off everything else, I'm just going to select over it, holding my left click, and then I'm going to hit preview off. Okay, so now we're looking at the final result. And I can move both of these points and it'll create a different set of surfaces. Now here's, uh, here's where the controls of this get into play. So you can do a lot of different things. I've set this up so that you guys can go through and sort of alter this however you want to. Um, you know, you could, you could duplicate this, this script and plug in multiple sets of points at this point um, and have sort of different levels of amplitude coming off of each, that'll be your own investigation if you want to do that. Uh, but you can change the graph type. So you can do a conic graph, which is going to take an um, sort of loft to surface through each of these points trying to reset to normal. Um, and you can move this and that'll change the amount of curvature that it's feeling. Okay. Uh, you can do another type of graph. Uh, I like sine um, summation, which is two sine graphs on top of each other. So this is the main wave, and this is the frequency of the smaller wave. If I increase that, it becomes a little more obvious. Um, and then you can sort of increase and decrease this in order to create some really cool um, shapes. And if you just go crazy with it, at some point, you know, you get something that just the surface becomes crazy, but I love sort of how organic it looks. Um, anyways, so I hope this was um, helpful enough just to recap everything we went through. Uh, I'm going to turn off preview. So you create a, a, a surface, all right, in, in Rhino, and then you create two points. You use these two points as the, the center for whatever you want to do with this graph. I'm just going to reset it to a sign. Okay, and I'm going to decrease the amplitude on that to make it a little clearer. Um, so this is your center point, and this is repeated radially around each one of these points, creating constructive or destructive interference, um, much like ripples on a, piece of, on a, on a surface of water. Um, from there, you're going to register that surface, and you're going to divide it by any number of times that you want. The higher you make this slider, the more resolution you're going to have in your final outcome. The lower you make it, the more interesting um, sort of occurrences you're going to have if the wave becomes more frequent than the number of points you have on your surface. So you guys can play with that if you want to. I personally like setting this to 30, but you can set it higher if you want. Then we use those points and the distances from, from your newly generated grid of points to the points that we started at the beginning right, these two, to create sort of this, this range of numbers. And we re-wrap, re remap this range given the, the curve that you create in your graph, um, and that's going to radially repeat it around the outside. So then we're going to take and we're going to multiply whatever that value is so that you can alter the height using this slider. I have it at, you know, a, a fifth of what it was, um, but you can have it as twice that uh, depending on how you, how you want to do it. Um, you're going to multiply this wave uh, by your slider. And just to follow my own rule from the beginning, I'm going to take and I'm going to put this over at the start. You're going to multiply your wave. Uh, and then you're going to use that as the height or amplitude. Um, and the reason it's going to be the height is because you plugged in a z vector, which is this z axis. 
Um, and we're going to move the points in this grid given the wave that you created before. So, sorry, sometimes it's, it's easy to get lost here. If you navigate, you can find your way back home. And I just did that by right-clicking on the surface and hitting navigate. Um, so now we have the set of points that's moved based on this grid. You can alter it. It makes it a little more clear. And then we're going to go in and we're going to create a surface from this set of points. I'll get into it. U and V count later. Um, all you need to know is that every surface has its own set of grid points on it already and basically what this does is it matches these points to the surface that you were going to create anyways. So now you have a surface, okay? And then the last thing we're going to do in order to make this something that you could produce on the CNC is we're going to right click on it and we're going to hit fake, okay? And this is just giving you a set of options on which layer you want to put it on hit default, hit OK, and now that exists natively in Rhinoceros and you can move it around using your gumball tool. Okay. Um, something to think about is uh, if you want to manufacture this, obviously you know it can't be too deep. The drill bit on the CNC machine is only four inches tall. Um, and you don't want to have two fine waves, otherwise they won't show up because the drill bit uh, that we're going to use is probably an eighth inch ball mill. Um, I'll get into that, you know, in class. But uh, just think that, you know, if you measure something and it's less than a sixteenth of an inch wide or an eighth of an inch wide, it probably won't show up. So I recommend an eighteen inch by eighteen inch wide um, stock, and that that means you know the piece that you're going to cut out from. Um, we'll go over glue up and how to make that. On, it, on your own, uh, but I recommend 18 by 18, and then, you know, don't try and have too much detail to the point where you can't really tell what anything is, but have enough detail so that it's, you know, something interesting to look at and maybe put on your wall later. Um, this has been the first set of tutorials for um, basic understanding of Grasshopper, but also um, jumping into how to coordinate Rhino and Grasshopper together. I hope this script it, it is pretty complicated to start off with. If you just go through and make the same boxes and uh, make sure that you uh, flatten the points in the right places, um, you'll, make, you'll, you'll have a pretty easy go at it. Um, and uh, if you just replicate this and, and play with it and make your own result, you know, I, I think uh, you'll get a pretty nice understanding. Um, in class, I'm going to go through, or I will have gone through at this point, by the time you're watching this, if you watch this, um, I will have gone through and done the same exact tutorial in person for you, and I'll have fielded some questions. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. My email's on the syllabus. Um, or, you know, give me a, a call or try and find me in the Marvin Hall Bridge Lab. I'm in there a lot of the time. Um, and I'll be able to have, I'll, I'll be happy to walk you through basically how this works step by step. And I'll show you a couple of different ways that you can go through and really make something cool with it. Um, so I'm not going to save this because it's already on the server. If you're having problems, you know, just email me and I'll, I'll try and figure it out. Um, so I hope you enjoy this. If uh, you guys would, I'd love some feedback on it. If I talk too much, if I move too fast, uh, just let me know and I'll try and be better about it in the future. Um, I understand that I used a lot of words that maybe we hadn't used before. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a learning curve. And I think if maybe we could um, try and just jump past some of the basic, really, like, um, tough things like vocabulary can be that holds a class back from actually doing something like this. Uh, and maybe we work on that vocabulary over the course of the semester. We'll be a lot better off by the time we get to the end. Um, you have, you know, a few weeks to work on this. Please, you know... Like I said, contact me if you have any trouble whatsoever with this. I'm happy to help. There are software tutors in the Marvin Hall lab that are, that are pretty good at this stuff, too. Um, but I also recommend ATLV and digitaltoolbox.info. They're really nice grasshopper tutorials. Um, I'm not going to go through and, and teach you um, grasshopper, I think, through these, but I am going to show you how to do the assignment if you're at all lost, and I think hopefully that's what I did. So um, good luck. 
Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed learning about this. I'm sorry I talked so much, but um, like I said, I've always found that more information is better than less. So good luck with all of this, and I hope to see how your uh, CNC surfaces turn out. Um, enjoy your Labor Day weekend.